In this lecture, I'll be talking about the basis of a subspace. So here's the definition. A basis of a subspace H, so remember this means that this is a subset of Rn, which is closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication, and contains the zero vector. So we have some vectors, a set of vectors from that set that have these two properties. The first property is that the set is linearly independent. So remember what that means. That means that the only way that you could create a linear combination of these vectors, so C1 times B1 plus C2 times B2 plus 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 all the way up through Cp times Bp, the only way for that to equal the zero vector is if all of those scalars, C1, C2, all the way up through Cp, those are all the number zero. That's the only way that you can create a linear combination of those vectors that adds up to the zero vector. So that's one of the two conditions you have to have. The other condition is that the same set of vectors has to span that subspace. So remember the span of that set is all linear combinations of these vectors, in this case of the Bs. So what that would mean is that every vector in H can be written as a linear combination of these B vectors. So if you have both of those conditions, then this set of vectors is called the basis. And understanding what a basis is and how to work with it is really important for understanding how to deal with subspaces. For example, the null space and the column space that we talked about in the previous two lectures. So one example of a basis that we've already seen is the standard basis for Rn. So in this case, we're saying that the subspace H that we're talking about is all of Rn. I remember that's one sort of boring example of a subspace is when your subspace is everything. So a basis for that subspace is the standard basis, which are these E vectors that we've talked about. So E1 is the vector that has a one in the first spot and zeros everywhere else. E2 is the vector that has it one in the second spot and zeros everywhere else and so on. So these vectors have those two properties. Let's think about that for a second. So they say the first property is that the E's have to be linearly independent. So how, how can we sort of justify that? How can we understand why that's true? Well, if we had a linear combination, C1 times E1 plus C2 times E2 plus 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 Cn times En to equal the zero vector, well, C1 times E1, that's going to be an E1 in the, sorry, a C1 in the first spot and the zeros everywhere else because the C1 is going to get multiplied by that one. And then when we multiply by zeros, we'll get the rest being zeros. C2 is going to have a C2 or C2 times E2 is going to have a C2 in the second spot and zeros everywhere else and so on. And when we add all that up, that's going to be C1, C2, C3 and so on all the way up through Cn. So how could that equal the zero vector? Well, the only way that could equal the zero vector is if all of those c's are zero. c1 would have to be zero, c2 would have to be zero, and so on. So that's the first of my two conditions. The second of my conditions would say that these e's have to span my subspace. In this case, they would have to span Rn. So that would mean that every vector in Rn can be written as a linear combination of these vectors. So if we say, all right, let's give me a vector in Rn, right? Let's let y, which is just some vector, let's say y1, y2, up through yn, be an element of Rn. Well, I can build that vector y as a linear combination of the e's simply by multiplying e1 by y1. That'll put a y1 in the first spot and zeros everywhere else. y2 multiplied by e2, that'll put a y2 in the second spot and zeros everywhere else. Hopefully you see where I'm going. And then yn times en will put a yn in the last spot and zeros everywhere else. And when I add all that up, I will get my original vector y. And that shows that every vector in Rn can be written in this way. And that together, all of this that we've talked about, shows that this is a basis for the set Rn. But it's just one basis. There's actually lots and lots of different bases that we can construct for the space Rn. We're going to be focusing, though, on finding bases for null spaces and column spaces. So let's do a quick review. What's the null space of a matrix? So if you have an M by M matrix, the null space of A, which is written null A, is the subset of RM consisting of all solutions to the equation AX equals zero. It's all of the different vectors that you can get 
that when you multiply by a, you get the zero vector. So we'd like to find a basis for that. So just as an example, let's look at this matrix. So remember that if we want to find just a generic vector in the null space, what we need to do is we need to solve, that's what we're thinking to ourselves, we wanna solve the equation ax equals zero. And the way we're gonna do that is by setting up and row reducing an augmented matrix. So here's that work, here's the augmented matrix, and I've done the work and row reduced it for you. So if we think about the solution here, the general solution is going to be x1 equals 2x2 plus x3 minus, uh, sorry, that's x4 minus 3x5. x2 is free. x3 is going to be negative 2x4 plus 2x5 and x4 and x5 are free. That's the general solution, but as we've done before, we wanna write this in parametric form. So that parametric form looks like this. And as we've seen before, these three vectors here form a spanning set for the null space of A. But I claim that these three vectors form a basis for the null space of A. So what are the two conditions that I have to be thinking about? The first condition is that these vectors have to be linearly independent. And the second condition is that they have to span the null space of A. But that second condition we already have, right? We just said it here. These three vectors span the null space of A. So we've got the sort of second condition all taken care of. So why are these three vectors linearly independent? I want to think about why this process works in general, not just for the specific example. When we go through the process of finding the parametric solution to ax equals zero, why do the vectors that we get have to be linear, linearly independent? Well, remember that every vector in that parametric solution corresponds to one of our free variables. We're going to have one vector in our parametric solution for each free variable. And in that vector, there's going to be a one in the spot that corresponds to that free variable. And in all the other vectors, that same spot is gonna have a zero, right? So again, if you think back to the example we just did, when we think about x2 being free, we thought of that as the equation x2 equals x2. And that puts a one in the vector that corresponds to x2 and a zero in the other vectors that correspond to different free variables. So if we had a linear combination of those vectors equaling zero, well, in the x2 spot, the only way that that linear combination could turn out to be the zero vector is if the coefficient of the vector that has a one in that spot, that coefficient would have to be a zero. And the coefficients corresponding to the other spots for the other free variables, those would also have to be zero. Let's see this for the example that we just did. Okay, so here's my three vectors. So the, the points I want you to focus on are where the free variables are. So this right here, that was x2. And x2, right, so I called it c1 here, and we do that sometimes. We change the names of our parameters, right? But this was really x2. And this c2, that was really x4. And this c3, that was really x5. And so in the second spot where x2 would go, there's a one in that first vector, but a zero here and a zero here. So if I were to actually do this linear combination, this would be one c1 plus zero c2 plus zero c3. And how could that equal zero? Well, that means that c1 would have to be zero. And if I look at the x4, the same thing's gonna happen. In my x4 vector, I've got a one in that fourth spot, but zeros in the other spots, in the other vectors in that same spot. So again, if I think about a linear combination, this would be zero c1 plus one c2 plus zero c3 equaling zero. And that would imply that c2 would have to be zero. And then similarly, c3 would have to be zero because of the fifth spot. And that's always going to happen. So we're always going to have to have linearly independent vectors when we find our parametric solution. So here's our process. So if we want to find a basis for the null space of A, here's what we do. We find the parametric solution to the equation AX equals zero. The vectors that you get in your parametric solutions are linearly independent and they span the null space of A. That's the definition of basis. And so those form a basis for the null space of A. Okay, what about the column space? Again, let's refresh our memory on the definition here. So if we're given a matrix, the column space of A is the subset of Rn, which is all linear combinations of the columns of A. And again, our goal is to find a basis for that space. Now, finding a spanning set is easy, right? 
a spanning set would just be the columns of A, right? If I look at that set, that set of vectors certainly spans the column space of A, but those vectors might not be linearly independent. The columns of a matrix might not actually be linearly independent, so it might not be a basis. Remember, we need both of those conditions, linear independence and spanning, to be a basis. So let's look at an example. So here we have a matrix, and notice that this matrix is already row reduced, and that's going to help us think about this. So if I give these columns names, A1 through A5, what I want you to notice is that A2 here, this is A2, that's four times A1. And then A4 here, well, I see a two and a negative one. So that's going to be two times A1, which is this vector, which has a one in the first spot, and then minus A3, because A3 is the vector that has a one in the second spot. So the non-pivot columns here can be written as linear combinations of the other columns. Why is that helpful? Well, what this lets us do is this lets us take any linear combination of the columns of A, remember that's what the call A space is, any linear combination can be rewritten without those vectors. We can get rid of the vectors that are in columns that don't have pivots. And the way that we do that is using these equations. So we know that A2 is 4A1, so this A2 here can be replaced by 4A1. Leave A3, because A3 was a pivot column, but A4 can now be replaced by 2A1 minus A3. And then negative 3A5, we'll leave that alone. And now we can distribute our multiplication and rearrange and rewrite this as a linear combination of just A1, A3, and A5. So this is 3A1 minus 4A1 plus 4A3 plus 12A1 minus 6A3 minus 3A5. So I collect together all the A1s. I've got 3A1 minus 4A1 plus 12A1, so that's going to be plus 11A1. I've got 4A3 minus 6A3, so that's going to be minus 2A3. And then I've got minus 3A5. So what I've done is I've eliminated the columns that didn't have pivots in them. And in, when my matrix is row reduced, I'm always going to be able to do that. Now, that's great if my matrix is row reduced, but what if my matrix isn't row reduced? It's going to be a lot harder to spot those relationships among the columns when my matrix is not row reduced. But it turns out that those relationships are preserved by row reduction. So what we have here are two matrices, one row reduced, one not. So what I'm showing you here is B is A row reduced. So when I row reduce A, I get B. And what we can notice here are the relationships between the columns. So for example, this column here doesn't have a pivot in it. So if I call this vector B2, second column of matrix B, notice that this is negative 2 times B1. But if I go back to the matrix A, then column A2 is actually negative 2 times column A1, the same relationship. All right. As another example, let's look at column B4. Column B4 is negative 1, B1, plus 2, B3, right? There's my 1 in my first spot, my 1 in my second spot. And that same relationship holds. It's a little harder to see here, but if you work it out, A4 is negative 1, A1, plus 2, A3. Again, using those same uh, calculations. So there's exact same relationships that you can much more easily see when the matrix is row reduced. Those are visible when the matrix, uh, those are not visible for the original matrix, but they're still there. So what does that mean? That means that we can always eliminate the non-pivot columns from any linear combination of the columns of A, and what will remain will be a linearly independent set that still spans the column space of A. And so that's how we find a basis for call A. So what did we learn in this video? Three big things. One is the definition of basis. What does it mean for a set of vectors to be a basis of a subspace? And then the other two big things are how do we actually find a basis for the null space of A and for the column space of A? So a lot going on in this lecture. Hopefully it made sense. See you next time.